today up is down and down is up. Hello again, this is Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics, one of the posts covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. In this week's market review, we examine the curious relationship between updated economic data and the markets. And I conclude up is indeed down. We start with the US markets, look across Europe and Asia, and end in Australia, as well as covering the latest in oil and metals and a quick look at crypto. It appears equity traders have apparently gotten bored waiting for higher interest rates to make their presence known in the economy, despite increasingly thorny warnings from the Federal Reserve and shockingly frank revelations from the Bank of England last Thursday that recession is coming. The focus, rather, has been on celebrating buoyant earnings and economic reports. The S&P 500's performance over the past five days was virtually flat compared with the previous two weeks. And the central bank is nowhere near being almost done cracking down on inflation, according to San Francisco's Mary Daly. Cleveland's Loretta Mester is looking for persuasive evidence price pressures are moderating. And Chicago's Charles Evans said policymakers were a few reports away from seeing the kind of data that would make them think they're on the right track. So the Fed is definitive rates are going higher. The market is basically saying to the Fed, you're not going to have to go as far as you think you do. And also, you might have to start reversing course much sooner than you think you have to, said Katie Nixon, Chief Investment Officer at Northern Trust Wealth Management. But the question is, is that sustainable in the face of a Fed that appears to be hell-bent on not stopping, not stopping? And can I just say, I would really appreciate it if you would like this post. And if you haven't subscribed, do subscribe, because at the moment we're getting a lot of people watching our shows, but the like count is very low. Subscribing and liking our posts really does help us to get our message out. So would you please do that? Would appreciate it. Thank you. In the US, the S&P 500 ended lower on Friday, weighed down by Tesla and other technology-related stocks, and a good jobs report that torpedoed recent optimism that the Federal Reserve might let up on its aggressive campaign to rein in decades high inflation. In fact, data showed US employers hired far more workers than expected in July, the 19th straight month of payroll expansion, with the unemployment rate falling to a pre-pandemic low of 3.5%. Non-farm payrolls jumped 528,000 in July, way above the consensus of 250,000, and that brought the unemployment rate down to 3.5%, matching the lowest level since 1969. Where the household and establishment surveys sent mixed signals in previous months, the latest data showed unambiguously that the labour market remains red hot. Average hourly earnings rose 0.5% last month from a month earlier, pushing the year-over-year -year rate to 5.2%. Now, it's worth noting, though, that the participation rate is still lower than the pre-COVID at 62.1%. These gains in jobs and wages are simply inconsistent with the central bank's goal of stable prices. Some labour market pain is going to be required. The report added to recent data painting an upbeat picture of the world's largest economy after it contracted in the first half of the year. That deflated investors' expectations that the Fed might let up on its series of rate hikes amid a cooling economy. These remarkable numbers struck fear into the hearts of traders who instinctively know that they will embolden the Fed to raise interest rates even higher, with the two-year Treasury yield surging 20 basis points on the day, seemingly en route back to their June highs. Traders are right, of course, because the brisk pace of wages increase that's coming from the tight labour market is simply inconsistent with the Fed's goal of stable prices. Companies can't stop rising prices of goods and services while they're handing out rises at their pace. Fed Chair Jerome Powell is likely to see the latest report as a green light to stay aggressive with his interest rate increases, including maybe a 75 basis point one of the next meeting in September. This is all about the Fed. This is all about the Fed. A very strong jobs report like we've just had puts pressure on the Fed to tighten for longer, said Adam Sarkin, chief executive of 50 Park Investments. The market is scared the Fed is going to overshoot again. If they tighten too sharply and too long, that's going to cause a hard landing, a deep recession. 
traders are betting the Federal Reserve's peak interest rate, or the so-called terminal rate, is at 3.6%. This won't be enough, though, to stem inflation, given the strong labour market, said Jeffries. The terminal rate currently priced into the curve looks woefully inadequate. We expect the Fed to keep hiking through to the first quarter of 23 until they push the funds rate to 4 to 4.25%, Jeffries added. If the Fed turns more hawkish than expected, the market will take that as a big negative because right now it's pricing in a Fed funds rate that is nearer to the end of the cycle, Chief Market Strategist David Keller at Stockchart said. Before the current bout of inflation, many in the economics community were ready to abandon the historic emphasis on the relationship between unemployment and inflation, known as the Phillips curve. In the decades leading up to the pandemic, the curve had become more of a cloud, and many economists thought that the relationship had ceased to be very helpful either as a predictive or prescriptive tool. In fact, in 2019, San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly said the real argument was on whether it was dead or just gravely ill. That was easy to say when inflation itself seemed as if it was gone forever. But now the Phillips curve is back with a vengeance and features prominently in many of the most public debates about inflation. Among several others, economists Olivia Blanchard, Alex Domash and Lawrence Summers now suggest that the unemployment rate may have to rise to around 4.9% to get inflation under control. They say that the job market is overheating at current levels, as exemplified not only by low unemployment, but also by an unprecedented level of job vacancies. And Art Hogan, chief market strategist at B. Raleigh in New York, said anyone that was inclined to jump on board the pivot train is likely to jump off at the next station. This is not indicative of a Fed that will need to shift gears next year and start cutting rates. U.S. Treasury yields climbed as odds increased of a 75 basis point hike in September. The 10-year settled at 2.827, while the 2-year was at 3.229, still in inversion territory. That helped bank stocks like JP Morgan, which rose 3%, and helped the Dow Jones Industrial Average stay just in positive territory. Focus now shifts to inflation data due next week, with U.S. annual consumer price expected to jump to 8.7% in July, after a 9.1% rise in June. The S&P 500 declined 0.16% to end the session at 4,145. The Nasdaq declined 0.5% to 12,657, while the Dow Jones Industrial rose 0.23% to 32,803. For the week, the S&P 500 rose 0.4%, the Dow fell 0.1%, and the Nasdaq added 2.2%. Tesla tumbled 6.6% and weighed heavily on the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq. And Facebook owner Meta Platforms lost 2% and Amazon fell 1.2%, also pulling down the index. Lyft surged almost 70% though after the ride-hailing firm forecast an adjusted operating profit of $1 billion for 2024 after posting record quarterly earnings. And energy rose 2% to pair some losses from a day earlier as oil prices rebounded as fears about a recession hurting demand eased following the stronger jobs report. AMC Entertainment reported a slightly wider than expected quarterly loss and announced that it would issue dividends to all common shareholders in the form of preferred shares. Its shares jumped nearly 19%. The move in effect creates a two-for-one stock split with half listed under AMC and half under APE, Wedbush said. And Block fell 2% despite delivering quarterly results that beat on both the top and bottom lines as investors that digested a 34% slump in its cash app business. Now over in the UK, the FTSE 100 closed lower on Friday, dipping 0.1%, with shares in WPP, the world's largest advertising group, falling 8.8% after its annual sales outlook failed to excite investors expecting stronger forecasts. The mid-caps index finished down 0.5% as the global mood soured after a solid US jobs report for July bolstered the case for the Federal Reserve to press ahead with interest rate hikes. Still, the FTSE 100 marked weekly gains as sterling came under pressure after the Bank of England on Thursday warned of a long UK recession even as it raised interest rates by the most in 27 years. The index is home to several global companies that draw a large part of their revenue overseas, so a weakening sterling actually benefits the stocks. The Bank of England on Thursday raised its bank rate 
by half a percentage point to 1.75%. That's the highest level since late 2008 in an attempt to control soaring inflation. But they said that Britain would enter a recession at the end of 2022 and not emerge until early 2024. See my earlier posts for more details. Central banks generally tend to soft soap when it comes to bad news. However, the frankness behind the Bank of England's economic assessment was as dark as it could be, said Michael Hewson, chief market analyst at CMC Markets in the UK. The FTSE SE 200 index, more exposed to the domestic economy, posted a weekly decline of 0.5% as worries of slowing economic growth weighed on shares of home builders, retailers and travel and leisure firms. The London Stock Exchange Group rose 1.6% though after it said its costs and savings targets for the integration of data company Refiniv were on track and it was launching a £750 million share buyback. European stocks traded in a mixed fashion on Friday with the DAX in Germany lower by 0.65% to 13,573 and the CAC 40 in France down 0.63% to 6,472. European equities registered gains this week as largely positive corporate earnings overshadowed fears that the region is heading for an economic slowdown later this year, despite higher gas prices and tightening of supply. Helping the tone on Friday was the news that German industrial production eked out a surprise gain in June as output in Europe's manufacturing powerhouse rose 0.4% from May. In corporate news, Allianz stock fell 2.7% after the German insurer posted a hefty 23% fall in second quarter net profit, dampened by volatile markets. And on the flip side, Deutsche Post stocks rose 5.9% after it reported double-digit growth in revenue and earnings boosted by its flourishing freight and express business. Oil prices edged higher on Friday but were down across the week after falling to a six-month low on concerns a global economic slowdown will severely hit demand. The oil market has now given back all the gains prompted by Russia's invasion of Ukraine with growth worries ratcheted up after the Bank of England's recession warning. Still, supply remains tight with the Organisation of Petroleum Exporting Countries and its allies, a group known as OPEC+, Plus, increasing production by a minimal 100,000 barrels per day in September, equal to about 0.1% of global oil demand. So in a way, Biden failed in his attempt to get greater supply. Benchmark US oil futures fell below 90 US dollars a barrel for the first time since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. US crude futures traded 0.1% higher at $88.53 a barrel, on course for a weekly loss of almost 10%, while the Brent contract rose 0.8% to 94.38, that's a weekly loss of 14%. If these prices hold lower, that could bring some relief in lower pump prices eventually. Additionally, gold futures fell 0.08% to 1,792, but traded near a one-month high after jumping the most since March on Thursday, as US-China tensions and a deepening global economic slowdown buoyed demand for haven assets. Bullion headed for a third weekly gain, even as prices slipped on Friday after China likely fired missiles over Taiwan during military drills. Beijing has responded aggressively to US House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit to the island this week. Gold has risen about 5% from a low on July 20th, benefiting from a weakened dollar and falling US bond yields, which have decreased by around 40 basis points over the past two weeks, according to Commerce Bank AG analysts. Most Asian stocks logged strong gains on Friday, recovering some of their losses from earlier in the week as the focus turned to those US payrolls. Taiwan stocks gained the most among their peers, rising 1.8%, and the index was hit hard by concerns over growing political tensions with China and is set to end the week marginally lower. Chinese stocks rose slightly on Friday, with the blue chip Shanghai index adding 0.3%. But a mix of tensions over Taiwan and sluggish manufacturing data put the benchmark on course to lose around 1.4% for the week. Asian stocks had marked a strong recovery from weekly lows on Thursday as the batch of strong US earnings increased optimism over corporate prospects. Investors in the region are now bracing for the slew of earnings reports next week from Chinese, Japanese and South Korean heavyweights. Hong Kong shares of Chinese e-commerce giant Alibaba Group fell 2.2% to 
to 92.90 Hong Kong dollars. Wang on the broader Hang Seng Index after the firm logged a flat revenue in the June quarter. But the results of the firm were slightly better than expected, pointing to some resilience in the Chinese economy. That's Alibaba's biggest market. And shares of peer JDCom fell 0.6%, while those of tech giant Tencent Holdings dropped 1.7%. Tencent is set to report its half-year earnings on August 17th. The Shanghai index was up 1.19% to 3,226, while the Hang Seng in Hong Kong rose 0.14% to 20,201. In Australia, a share market rebound gained steam on Friday as a strong session for battery metal and businesses capped a weak bolster by better than expected corporate profits in the US and those oil price falls. The benchmark S&P ASX 200 index climbed 0.6%, to reach 7,015 points, its highest level since closing at 7,019 points on June the 9th. Next week, Commonwealth Bank, Telstra and QBE will report. I think earnings here will be good as it relates to a period in the economy which was strong, said Shane Oliver, the chief economist at AMP. The last half year has been strong. You'll see it in the low unemployment and retail sales. Investment was okay. Overall economic growth in the first and second quarters looks to have been good. CBA was down 0.38% to 10141. NAB was up 0.03% to $30.91. Westpac was up 0.5% to 2196. And ANZ rose 0.75% to 2295. Macquarie was up 0.59% to 17693. On Friday, the best performing sector was materials, which added 1.9%. Lithium and iron ore producer mineral resources soared 3.9%, and BHP was up 1.7%. Battery tech group Nominix surged 14%. Gold miners also rallied as the precious metal extended the gains to fetch around US$1,800. The Aussie dollar fell 0.1% to 6930 and yields on Australian 10-year bonds settled at 3.216, while the two-year was up 5.39% to 2.899. Shane Oliver says consensus forecasts for Australian corporate earnings growth of 7% on average in the financial year 2023 may be a little high. I've been in the camp that falls in the markets have further to go, but they keep surprising. On the upside, he said, it's possible we've seen the bottom. The oil price looks to have topped. That's bad for our energy stocks, but good for the rest of the market. And over in crypto, crypto exchange Coinbase and asset management giant BlackRock agreed to a landmark deal to provide crypto services to institutional investors. According to Coinbase's blog post, the digital assets exchange and BlackRock are set to establish new access points to support crypto adoption among institutional investors. Under the terms of the deal, joint customers of Coinbase Prime and Aladdin BlackRock's investment management platform will gain access to crypto trading, prime brokerage and reporting features. Joseph Chalon, BlackRock's global head of strategic ecosystem partnership, said our institutional clients are increasingly interested in gaining exposure to digital asset markets and are focused on how to efficiently manage the operational life cycle of these assets. This connectivity with Aladdin will allow clients to manage their Bitcoin exposures directly on their existing portfolio management and trading workflows for a whole portfolio view of risk across asset classes. The deal was initially apply only to Bitcoin, said a BlackRock spokesperson. She added that the two companies will expand to other cryptocurrencies based on the client demand. Coinbase Prime is a global prime broker platform for digital assets used by more than 13,000 institutional investors. The platform was designed specifically for institutions' needs and allowed trade execution services for 200 assets, custody services of more than 300 assets, prime financing, data and analytics reporting, and more. The deal was announced just months after BlackRock CEO Larry Fink said Russia's invasion of Ukraine could boost crypto adoption among central banks. He described this as a less discussed outcome of the ongoing war, which will prompt countries to re-evaluate their currency dependencies, he said. 
even before the war, several governments were looking to play a more active role in digital currencies and define the regular frameworks under which they operate. He added, The partnership comes amid a very challenging year for the crypto industry, with most of the cryptocurrencies standing down at multi-year lows due to record high inflation and hawkish monetary policy by global central banks. Several major crypto firms have declared bankruptcy due to the market downturn, including Celsius Network and Voyager Digital. Coinbase itself also faced significant headwinds this year, including insider trading allegations against its former employees. The crypto exchange made multiple changes to its token listing procedures earlier this year to address the problem. And elsewhere, the crypto platform Voyager Digital, which filed for bankruptcy protection last month, said it expects to resume user access to the app for cash withdrawals next week. The withdrawal is anticipated to start on August the 11th for dollar holdings only, the company said in a blog post on Friday. The announcement came after the court approved its proposals to restore access to cash held for customers at Metropolitan Commercial Bank. And customers can file claims against Voyager for their crypto holdings by a deadline of October the 3rd, it said. And Bitcoin lingered nearer $23,000 US this week after the report showed that the US added more jobs than forecast last month and its renewed concern that higher interest rates could reduce demand for riskier assets. The largest cryptocurrency rose by as much as 4.2%, to 23,467 on Friday before pairing back that increase. Bitcoin remains firmly within the range of around 19,000 to $25,000 that it's held since mid-June, and Ether was up as much as 8.4% to 1,124 before also pulling back a bit from the highs of the day. That was not a good jobs report for risk assets, Craig Earlham, market analyst at Onda said in an email that could worsen any slump further down the road, which is why we're seeing risk assets sinking and Bitcoin is very much among them. It's still a little higher on the day, but it's given back a fair bit of its earlier gains. Other coins remained higher, with Polkadot and Avave gaining more than 5%. Cryptocurrencies have traded in tandem with risk assets for months, seeing high correlations with the Nasdaq 100 in particular, and they've struggled as expectations for Federal Reserve rate hikes increased amid stubbornly high inflation, but have climbed off their worst levels of the past few months. And finally, the man who predicted the financial crisis is warning about silliness in markets. Michael Burry, the founder of Scion Asset Management, who's best known for betting against the housing market ahead of the 2008 crash, said on Thursday that the familiar COVID era silliness is not yet dead. It's not entirely clear what Burry, who's known for his cryptic tweets, is referring to. He compares this period in markets to 2001 before the September 11 terrorist attack and the Enron and WorldCom scandals, which the dot com bubble was unwinding. And as he often does with his tweets, Burry deleted it hours after posting. Burry's been forecasting a plunge in stock prices for months, which turned out to be precedent for a time as the S&P 500 posted its worst first half in the year since 1970. And he predicted at the end of June that the market was almost halfway through its decline. Since then, though, the S&P 500 index has up nearly 10% through to Thursday's close, and the Nasdaq 100 has rallied more than 15%, although markets, of course, on Friday were lower. But there still is silliness, indeed, because central banks are upping the ante on controlling inflation, and the markets are yet to realise this, still hoping for a near-term reversal. It may take a few weeks, but I suspect the measures of recession from the UK central bank will finally start to be replicated elsewhere. Now, if that happens... Markets will fall and fall further than they have already. So up is indeed down. It's all a matter of timing. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.